Good evening, everyone. I'm Brittany Edding, Assistant Professor at Rice School of Architecture. And on behalf of the Lectures Committee and Co-Chair Sarah Nichols, I would like to welcome you all tonight to, to tonight's lecture, Negation and Disavowal in Spatial Politics with Dr. Michael Stone Richards. I wanna begin by thanking the Dean John Kasbarian, the Rice Design Alliance, and the students, staff, and faculty who helped make this lecture series happen. Before we get started with the introduction, a quick note on the Q&A. For those of you watching the lecture, please feel free to ask a question by typing it into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Our student representative, Mai Okimoto, will read them out loud for discussion after the lecture. So to begin, the Rice Architecture Fall 2020 lecture series on race, social justice, and allyship is part of a school-wide initiative to address how architecture and the built environment have played a key role in the perpetuation of racial inequality and injustice. As architects, we must answer a long overdue call to examine how racial violence is with, inscribed within and reinforced through space. A violence that is at once both visible and invisible, immediate and systemic, bodily and immaterial. Critical to the self-examination is an acknowledgement not only of the spatial dimension of racism, but also of how architecture is a site upon which parallel injustices of social inequity, labor exploitation, and environmental toxicity continue to accelerate and accumulate. To this end, we have invited designers, scholars, and activists to speak toward this triangulation of space, race, and power, setting an agenda for solidarity and action within architecture. Tonight, I'm honored to welcome Dr. Michael Stone Richards to share his work and research with us this evening. Dr. Stone Richards is a professor of critical practice and visual studies at the College for Creative Studies in Detroit and editor of Detroit Research. He's been a visiting fellow in critical studies at Cranbrook Academy of Art, a fellow at the CCA in Montreal, and has received a Warhol Foundation grant for his ongoing project, Care of the City. His work navigates the intersection of aesthetics and biopolitics, working through critical readings of literature, poetry, film, and art to reflect on exile and subjectivity in the African diaspora, as well as the tension between care and conflict participation and dissensus in contemporary forms of spatial practice. His 2011 book, Logics of Separation, Exile and Transcendence in Aesthetic Modernity, reflects on the psychic processes of identity and estrangement in the works of W.B. Du Bois, Franz Fanon, and Ralph Ellison. His forthcoming book, Care of the City, Ruination, Abandon, and Hospitality in Contemporary Practice, examines the relationship between poets and practitioners, such as Rilke and the League of Revolutionary Black Workers, John Acontra with, his home, with Homer's Odyssey, among uh, many others. Arguing that care is embodied, spatial, and durational, his work represents in many ways a projective agenda for architectural practice, one that emphasizes careful attention, unconditional hospitality, and a willingness for co-presence. So with that, I'd like to turn this over to Michael. Thank you again and welcome. Thank you very much um, for that generous introduction. Thank you for the invitation as well. And Christine and your team, thank you for making all of this possible. Um, in the last few months, um, we've all overcome our <laughs> sense of panic as we've learned, uh, I won't say acquired, but as we've learned new skills, which in time will become acquisitions. Um, the subject is of course also very, time very timely and it's let me say just a little uh, about my background um Brittany, you mentioned that i'd had a fellowship at the canadian center of architecture which was some time ago in 1997-98 and a lot of the work that i did at the canadian center of architecture which was on the phenomenology of space in 1950s, 1960s, French avant-garde philosophy and architecture, especially around the work of Guy Debord, um, I had put aside when I moved to Detroit, which now strikes me as a very odd thing. I thought that this was not something that um, students at CCS uh, would be interested in. I was not for the first time terribly wrong um, that I found myself going back to work that I did many years ago, updating that work precisely because of my students' interest. And I would like to thank my students at CCS um, in my class on Care of the City and also 
students at Cranbrook where I was a visiting fellow in critical studies last year. And some of the ideas that I'm pulling together in the final stages of my Care of the City project um, received a certain form um, during my time at Cranbrook. So thank you very much for this opportunity. Now, let me begin by reading from Rice's own language. This lecture series is part of an initiative to acknowledge, and I'm going to emphasize certain words, to acknowledge, understand, and act upon systemic racism in the built environment. The aim of the lecture series is to foreground issues of race, architecture, social equity, and environmental justice, and gender parity in the school's curriculum, while more broadly fostering solidarity and action in architecture. There isn't anything there with which one can disagree. And one of the things that I'd first like to start out by saying is that this is, of course, a project of education that is not merely education uh, as vocational training. This is not simply about saying, here, this is how we put together a building. Here are the building codes that you need to follow. But this is, in fact, about education as a formation in critical practice. In that light, then, one wants to ask, OK, but what is it that has, and the three words that I've isolated for emphasis, acknowledge, acknowledge understand, and solidarity, what is it that has stopped or preempted acknowledgement of all the things that we can agree on, um, social equity, environmental justice, gender parity, um, et cetera. What is it that has preempted? What is it that has stopped the implementation of these values? And what is it in the very nature of understanding itself that might complicate acknowledgement or undermine solidarity? And here, let me say, that I take the word solidarity as a synonym for care. Some of you may remember the great trade union movement from Poland in the 1970s and 80s, Solidarność, solidarity, where solidarity absolutely means care. Solidarity means to be alongside. Now, my title, which is quite, quite um, a large title, um, negation and disavowal in social practice, in the politics of, of space, points to something much more negative. That is to say, what I'm concerned with is not what I think it is that we ought to be doing, but what are the obstacles, the perennial obstacles to what might be possible. For instance, most of the issues with which anyone, any progressive person, be they of the left or a certain kind of progressive conservative, if you look at the people at the Lincoln Project um, who come close to what in Canada or England maybe call red Tories, um, there is a certain agreement across the spectrum about, you know, for example, the Lincoln Project people now openly say, yes, we made a mistake. Um, the party, the Republican Party of which we have been a part of for all of our lives is plainly a racist party. And what I want to say is that many of the problems that we want to address, most of the problems are in fact not distinctively racial problems. There are problems of class, there are problems of poverty, there are problems of access to resources, to education, etc. And if this is the case, then one of the things that this will tell us is that the problem is not entirely one of efficiency or of rationality or of reason. We don't want to dismiss efficiency, rationality, or reason, but the problem is in fact not at that level. If we could address certain things along class lines, if we could address um, questions of poverty, if we could address questions uh, to do with the access to, res to resources, we would go a long way, but we would not 
I would suggest, come close to being able to understand the nature of the racial problem in the United States. The term that I'd like to use from Orlando Patterson, the Harvard sociologist, is symbolic. The problem is to do with the symbolic. And I will touch upon what I mean by the symbolic. But here's how I want to formulate in a very crude or relatively crude way what I think the problem is. And here I'm using both a phenomenological and a psychoanalytic term, resistance. <laughs> what is the resistance? And we'll come to Freud and Stanley Cavell in a moment who are the main part of my talk. What is the resistance to addressing certain of these political, certain of these moral, and indeed philosophically anthropological problems? I want to allude to two very different thinkers, different in their style. The American essayist, Elizabeth Hardwick, and the French avant-gardist, Guy, de, Guy Debord. And what I'm, what I'm trying to do here is to say, here is, the, here is a way in which very different sorts of people have identified the racial dynamic at work in the United States. Over this summer, I wrote an essay on the photography of one of my friends and colleagues at CCS, Carlos Diaz, on the Confederate monuments in the South. This was something that he'd been working on um, over two years ago, and we discussed over a year ago. And you can imagine, all of a sudden, this past summer, what an extraordinary coincidence, not coincidence, what an extraordinary convergence uh, it was when suddenly these monuments became the focus of a lot of anger, of a lot of overcoming, attempt to overcome resistance. And whilst working um, on my colleague's um, photography, I went back and looked at a lot of stuff in the history of modern photography, and in particular of Robert Frank's work, um, the great photography collection, the Americans from 19, its first edition was in French in 1958 and then in 1959 in the United States. And the essay was written, the essay of introduction was written by no less than Jacques Kerouac. And there is an extraordinary passage where Jacques Kerouac writes very simply um, in the photography of, of Robert Frank, man, black, mad mourners, and death is like life, what else? I repeat, man, black, mad mourners, and death is like life, what else? This simplicity of mourning and black existence, and this, by the way, is not to commit the great sin that Ralph Ellison was always complaining about, that black life is not, is not misery. That is actually not what we're talking about. But the recognition of the inbuilt aspect of a certain kind of mourning, a certain kind of limitation on black life is key to an understanding of a problem that is in fact fundamentally, fundamentally not the problem of black Americans. Gidebor, in an extraordinary essay from 1966 on the riots in Watts, which had taken place in Los Angeles in 1965. And he would return to this in 1967 after the riots in Detroit. In an extraordinary reflection, he said, he wrote, and I'm quoting from the French, it's not the crisis of the status of blacks in America that is at issue, it's the, it's the crisis of the status of America posed through blackness, right? It is not the crisis of, of, of black people, of the status of black people, it is the crisis of America posed through blackness. And this is in an essay called The Decline and Fall of Spectacular, Spectacular Commodity e Economy. And, and indeed, wherever a group or population becomes a problem, 
right? A problem of the genre of what is to be done with the Jews? What is to be done with the Negroes? What is to be done with Native Americans, with Kulaks? Now today in Uyghurs in China, the problem is not this particular group of people, but a kind of what I'm going to call a psychotic kernel within a dominant mode or form of life that seeks a sacrificial victim in the targeted groups. The Boer goes on to say that Black Americans are defavorized from the get-go. And when the Boer writes this in 1966, he is in fact not saying anything fundamentally different than what the great West Indian sociologist at Harvard, Orlando Patterson, has long argued, but particularly in his book, Religions of Blood, where he speaks of white violence against America as a kind of what I would call savage religion. Indeed, he looks at lynching and lynching photographies as a kind of uncontrolled, that is outside, outside of certain institutional church structures, as a kind of uncontrolled religious activity. And so the Boer goes on to say, Blacks as a whole, dans leur ensemble, as a whole, must represent poverty, the poverty of a society that is rich and hierarchical. That is the function that they fill in the American system. Elizabeth Hardwick, very different style, very different background, will say something similar. When she, again, in 1965, writing also in light of the riots, the, 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 the riots in Watts in 1965, she says, and I quote, we know that only the severest concentration will keep the claims of the Negro alive in America because he, the Negro, represents all the imponderables of life itself. Going back to that quote from Jack, Jack Kerouac, where the very idea of what life is, is put on, is a weight that the black person must bear because he represents all the imponderables of life itself. So what those, what those thinkers are saying is that if we're going to begin to understand the problem, of course it is not a black problem in the way in which, quote unquote, the Jewish problem was not a Jewish problem. It was a problem for a dominant group within society. And in effect, what one is suggesting here is that a certain group from the get-go, from the start, is, defa is defavored, says Guy Debord, comes to represent a kind of sacrificial victim. This language is not easy language, I, I grant, but such is the continuous violence of which this group is victimage, that is the victim, that we need to look at something like this. Now, from there, I want to go very quickly to suggest, put this in a framework of care that I've been talking, I've been working on for a number of years, and I'm close to wrapping up uh, a book on this subject. And in the light of everything that we've been experiencing um, since COVID um, became part of our everyday lives, and by the way, only in the sense that our everyday life has as, 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 as collapsed, there is now much talk about care. Just three days ago, this book arrived from England, The Care Manifesto. Um, there are groups in Europe and the United States who are arguing uh, about the reorganization of society along the lines of care. There has long been an ethics of care tradition, and that is actually an important part of my work. But I want to make a bridge from what I've just said about the way in which certain groups are earmarked from the get-go to the idea of care. And a particular version in the book I have, I outline a theology of care, 
psychoanalysis of care, but there's a particular version of care that I want to bring to the table today before I go into the main part of my talk. And this is the way in which Heidegger, Martin Heidegger, conceives care. First, I need to make, make it quite clear that when Heidegger talks about care, he is not talking about care in a psychological sense. He is not talking, he is not conceiving of how I may care for my son, you may care for your, your, your closest friends. Care is not for Heidegger, first and foremost, something psychological. It is ontological. Of course, there are implications within the psychological realm, but it is ontological. What, is the, what, do, I, what do I mean by this? If we think about care in psychological terms, then obviously I am going to choose to care for those with whom I, I already have certain emotional bonds, certain connections, and family, friends. There's a kind of hierarchy of care. And I may or may not feel a certain sense of responsibility towards others, depending on what my social um, function in life might be. All of this is fine, but that is not what Heidegger means by care. What Heidegger means by care, to keep it at its core, is radical anxiety. In Being in Time, he outlines a conception of care that says that care is the radical anxiety that I experience when confronted, and this is one of those simple phrases that is incredibly powerful in Heidegger, when confronted with what he calls the collapse of familiarity. The collapse of familiarity, that's partly Heidegger's way of saying the collapse of the everyday, the collapse of everyday life, the routines, the rituals that make up everyday life, but also the collapse, not only of everyday life, but of a certain kind of self that goes with that everyday life. He calls it the inauthentic everyday self. The part of me that is linked to certain routines, certain rituals that require, don't require me to engage, that goes when everyday life collapses. Until January, February, March of this year, the kinds of examples that I use to convey the collapse of familiarity were disasters. There are many examples that one could use, but I tended to go to disasters like the tsunami from in Indonesia of 2004. Absolutely, most of us, starting with me, have no connection to Indonesia. Or the Fukushima, in Fukushima, the meltdown the nu of the nuclear reactor until my daughter went to study, one of my daughters went to study in Japan, I had absolutely no connection uh, with Japan. And yet, there are certain moments, certain events befall us, like the Fukushima meltdown, like the tsunami in Indonesia, that we suddenly feel a connection to something that is not us or that is not ours. Closer to home, because this doesn't only happen to strangers, as it were, closer to home, something like this happened with Katrina in 2005, that suddenly there was this collapse of all of the structures of everyday life, and we could feel that we were in some way connected with people whom we did not know. And what Heidegger is saying here is that care, which is not something psychological, it's not something that I choose, care is precisely something that I feel when there is a sense of radical exposure. 
It's the sense of radical exposure and of radical vulnerability that suddenly makes me aware of my relatedness. And this is key for Heidegger, not only to others, as in other human beings, but also to things that are not human beings, the environment, animals. Um, in my Care of the City class, when I'm introducing the concept of care, I, I started showing there are lots of videos and there are lots of stories. If you just go into Google and put in man saves dog, you will find lots and lots of stories of complete strangers risking their lives to save an animal. And it's not even their animal, right? So what is it that happens when someone suddenly, when someone sees an animal in a river, a stranger in a river, and in an instant, and the idea of suddenness here is key, it's something that we could talk about at length. In an instant, I feel that I must do something, including put my life at risk. This summer in Detroit, a fire officer, a well-trained, well-experienced fire officer, saved two young sisters who were complete strangers to him and he lost his life. His daughter, his 10 year old daughter was there watching all of whom he left to go and save these two strangers, was there watching all of this and in effect being traumatized by watching her father die saving two complete strangers. This imposition, says Heidegger, is I don't choose to care. And that there are certain moments when the choice of caring is not mine. Caring is something that is imposed. And this can only happen when there is a collapse of familiarity. And in that collapse of familiarity, there is this radical suddenness. It's not something that, oh, gradually it dawns on me, I think I'd better start to show some care. No, it is sudden and it is irreversible. I would like to suggest now in the context of COVID that COVID is now the, since the Second World War, World War maybe, it's the first time that everyone has been in a similar position of precariousness. And yes, I'm, I'm absolutely aware of all of the social differentials uh, involved in the experience of COVID from a class point of view, from a racial point of view. Living in Detroit, one cannot be unaware of that. But we've not been in a situation where everyone at a certain level felt exposed through the collapse of familiarity, through the collapse of everyday life. And one of the things that I think that this collapse of, of familiarity, this collapse of, every, of the everyday, and the collapse of the type of self that, goes, that, that is involved, made possible was in fact the response to the killing and murder of George Floyd in April in Minneapolis. The question is asked over and over again, why now? What was it about George Floyd's killing death that made this kind of reaction possible? The other term that I would like to introduce that I think is present in Heidegger's work, and by the way, I also think is present in the work of Judith Butler, who has been very, very um, useful for me in this respect. The other term is entanglement. What I would like to say, and my formula for this, is care reveals entanglement. Not mutual inter interdependence, but entanglement. Let me explain. 
The term entanglement is an anthropological term. And it means not merely that systems, people, systems, ecologies are in some way mutually dependent, mutually interlinked. More precisely, entanglement means that we have dependencies. And if we speak of dependencies, what that means is that we're speaking of relations of power. And one of the things that COVID has revealed there all along, but it was everything seemed to be organized so that we could ignore it. One of the things that COVID revealed is our entanglement, our dependency. And so much in our culture and society is designed to encourage us to ignore dependency, to see dependency as a kind of failure. What's the opposite of dependency? It's autonomy. Um, we speak of moral autonomy. We speak of political autonomy. Autonomy. Um, those who make liberty their their main political uh, uh, political value um, put autonomy above, say, equality, equality, etc. But entanglement is about dependency, not interdependency, but dependency. That is to say that there are relations of power in which each of us is at some point dependent. In other words, another kind of vulnerability. And so my argument here is that care reveals through this kind of violence of the sudden collapse of familiarity, care reveals entanglement. Now, from this entanglement, we get to the next thing that is key in my work, and then I'm going to transition um, to Freud and some Cavell. If care reveals entanglement, and I've noticed that one of the speakers, a pair of speakers that you have in a couple of weeks will be talking about attention and architecture. If care reveals entanglement, care also reveals attention and what I would call aporias of attention. Indeed, in all of the etymologies in Germanic language, and English is a Germanic language here, care is a synonym of attention. The British philosopher Gilbert Ryle said quite simply, to care is to pay attention. To care is to notice. Because certain actions, be they political, be they cultural, are not possible without a certain level of attention and attentiveness. Indeed, one could say that much of contemporary polit politics, much of contemporary political conflict is in fact a conflict of attention. Be and the reason it's a conflict of attention is because attention usually leads to resources. Let me give you an example. In 2015, First, I read about this on Huffington Post, but then in Atlanta, lots of newspapers. You may remember in 2015 that a lion in, in Zimbabwe um, called Cecil the Lion was killed by a dentist from Minnesota. I don't know what the thing is about Minnesota, but there we are. It's Minnesota again. And all hell broke loose all over the world, but particularly the Western part of the globe, people were hating on this dentist to such an extent that he had to go in hiding. Um, it didn't matter that his killing of Cecil the lion uh, was perfectly legal, that he wasn't you know, uh, just turning up and illicitly, illegally um, game hunting. He had a legitimate license to go game hunting. It's a form of revenue, in fact, in Zimbabwe. But he was hated on. And there was a sense of public sorrow, care, in other words, for the death of the lion, expressed in the hatred toward the violent hatred towards this dentist in Minneapolis. Then articles started to come out, one, two, three, many, but the title of which 
one title that I remember very clearly, Dead Lion Gets More Attention Than Dead Black Bodies. I repeat, Dead Lion Gets More Attention Than Dead Black Bodies. What was involved in the attention and why does it matter? I want to suggest that the attention matters, not only at the ethical level, we cannot care if we do not pay attention. We therefore cannot act if we do not pay attention. But that in fact, there's not only an ethics of attention, should I attend to you? Should I care for you? Should I care about you? Should I respond to you? There's not only an ethics of attention, there is in fact also a politics of attention. And the politics of attention stems from the fact that we are finite beings. And as finite beings, we cannot pay equal attention to all things that are important. There are, when I last looked, 50, 60 odd people on, on this Zoom, we could go around and say, each one of us name no more than two things that are of fundamental importance to you. And we would soon realize that each of these things, which is valuable, could not be equally important or could not be realized in any society in which we live. Right? Let me put that another way. Dead lion gets more attention than dead black bodies. Another way in which we could look at this is to ask, well, what does the lion stand for? What is the metonymy of the lion? The lion stands for one, unequal power relations between Western world and African country. That strikes me as a very important thing. Two, the dead lion stands for unequal power relations between humans and nature, the ravaging of nature, the exhaustion of, nat of, na of nature, the abuse of natural resources. That strikes me as equally important. So we can turn this around and say, no, intuitively, the anger, the hurt was in fact at another example of the imbalance of power relations at the global level. That as it were, this dentist from Minneapolis is only able to go to Zimbabwe and behave in the way that he does, he did, because of this imbalance of power. And so if we wanted to pay attention to this imbalance of power between West and Africa, if we wanted to pay attention to the imbalance of power between nature and the West, we would have to reorganize our society. And a, a society reorganized along those lines would no doubt be a more compelling society for some of us to live, but it is not a society that would say that and all other things are equal and therefore can get equal attention. I do not mean to imply by this that certain things are more important. Precisely the point that I'm making is that name your value and it is not possible that all values can be given with equal attention. And in that light then, the politics of attention kicks in because attention leads to resources. I think that that is the fundamental meaning of that phrase that we use a lot, not only in the context of Black Lives Matter, the politics of visibility. The politics of visibility is fundamentally a politics of attention. Now, how does Freud and Freud's essay on negation help us to understand all of this? And I want to make um, some quick comparisons with the work of Stanley Cavell on acknowledgement. Because in your statement, a statement that I agree with 100%, let me be clear, 
in your statement for this series of lectures, you talk about wanting to acknowledge, to understand, and to practice solidarity with gender parity, et cetera, um, social justice, environmental, environmental justice, et cetera. And of course, the purpose of inviting people like me is not only to say, yes, these are good aims, but here are some of the problems. I asked the architecture group to look at this short essay by Sigmund Freud from 1925. Uh, it's called Negation. It's only five pages long. And it's amongst the densest five pages that one could read in Freud. But that doesn't mean that it's inaccessible. It's not at all inaccessible. It repays attention. And I'm going to just list so that I, cover some ground before I run out of time. I'm going to list four broad categories where this essay is absolutely astoundingly important and philosophically highly significant. This essay, which has been overlooked within mainstream psychoanalysis, uh, at least mainstream American psychoanalytic thought, has been historically very important in the development of the Kleinian tradition, Melanie Klein and her followers. It was also of enormous, enormous importance to French psychoanalysis, and in particular, the school of Jacques Lacan. And the great Hegel scholar and translator, Jean Hipponite, um, who translated a Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit into French, it's still uh, an extraordinary translation to read. He, in the context of uh, Lacan's seminar in 1966, uh, gave a spoken commentary um, on it, which is absolutely superb, and this is the background. What is it? What are these basic categories that this short essay covers? And it's, these are categories I think that it covers that are highly relevant to a certain kind of architecture discourse of the kind that I'm interested in. I think from following um, Rice for a number of School of Architecture and Rice for a number of years, I think you guys also. One. It is an essay about the origin of thinking. It is an essay about the origin of thinking. Two, it is an essay about the origin of inside and outside. Therefore, it is fundamentally about spatiality. It is about the origin of inside and outside. Three, and this is what I'm going to address in the next few minutes. It is about the origins of psychotic tendencies. This is very important. It's about the origins of psychotic tendencies. And four, there could be more, but these are the, the ones that I think that are key. It is also an essay about the formation of the subject. It is an essay about the formation of the subject. And I would like to use a term that Freud does not use in this essay. It comes from the work of the great French psychoanalyst Jean Laplanche, implantation, implantation. It is not only an essay about the formation of the subject. It is also fundamentally an essay about the way in which the subject is formed by implantation. That is to say, that what it is to be a subject, what it is to be a person, is always something that comes from outside at its most fundamental level. That is to say that we internalize certain values, we internalize certain structures. And if we are therefore wanting to talk about change, radical change, radical transformation of values in society, it's not individual actions alone that will make the difference. Of course, one would rather that than not, but it is in fact broader structures. Because how we, how certain ideas and values are implanted in us and thereby form our idea of what it is to be a person and thereby what it is to be a human and thereby what gets to count as human or not human, because fundamentally in the racial discourse, that is what the issue is. The issue race is a stand-in 
It's not about color, right? Race is a stand-in for what gets to count as human or not human. And these are not ideas that individuals on their own simply decide to make up or to disavow. So it is about the formation of the subject through implantation, that is the internalization of certain structures, linguistic, cultural, social structures in the formation of the subject. I've said, though there's a certain density, philosophical density in negation, it's actually relatively simple as well to get into. Freud says, this is not, and this is actually not Freud even, it is relatively straightforward, that there are two kinds of negation, two types of negation that, he's talk, that he is talking about. And the negation, there is grammatical and logical negation, this is not the case. This is no longer the case. And then there's a kind of, we'll call it as a shorthand, a kind of psychological negation. And Freud says, look, in psychoanalysis, we're not really concerned with logical and grammatical negation. It's indeed, one of the fundamental theses of psychoanalysis is that there is no, no, he concludes at the end of this essay, you may remember, uh, there is no, no in the, in the unconscious, right? There is no, no, just as there is no time in the unconscious. So what does he mean? He says that he's noticed, and again, this is part of Freud's genius, and it's a genius that he, sh that he shares with Martin Heidegger. In Freud and Heidegger, there are, their language, is actually everyday German. When you see technical terms like Greek inflected technical terms like cathexis, which that was made up by his translators, translators who were, by the way, highly gifted, but they got it wrong on a number of occasions by giving this sense that Freud was using abstruse Greek inflected terms when in fact he was using everyday German. And a really key aspect of this essay is that the phenomenon of negation that Freud is talking about is in fact deeply ordinary. What is he talking about? Freud says that the use of the negation in psychoanalysis, when we're not dealing with logical or grammatical negation, represents the lifting of repression. It is when something escapes from repression, escapes from the unconscious and enters into, conscious, into the conscious mind at the same time, and this is key, that it is unconscious. So he gives some examples. It's not that I don't like my mother. <laughs> Freud kind of says, well, nobody asked him whether he liked his mother or not. We can therefore infer he doesn't like his mother. Or another example is that that person in my dream that I was talking about, it's not my mother. Freud can say, actually, it was his mother. In our everyday language, we will say things like, you are in denial. And of course, I respond, no, I'm not. And you know perfectly well. And by the way, anybody else who can witness it would say, would know perfectly well that my use of that, no, I am not in denial, is in fact a confirmation of the fact that I'm in denial. And at some level, I know that, but at the same time, it remains unconscious. Or something maybe more innocent, you forgot, didn't you? And, you sh and I respond, no, I didn't forget. But no, you did forget. And we know that. We witnessed a remarkable example of this way of thinking about negation again earlier this summer. And you will all remember it. You will all remember it. 
Amy Cooper, the white woman in Central Park, with the black Harvard educated birder, Christian Cooper, right? How does that example fit in? If you remember, Amy Cooper was in, in a part of Central Park that was not supposed to, where dogs were supposed to be kept on leash. And Christian Cooper, and by the way, no relation, though the part of me that is Freudian believes that that can't be an accident either. Um, so Christian Cooper, who is a birder and was in Central Park watching birds, asked her to put her dog on a leash and she refused and he persisted and does what people do nowadays, um, took out his phone camera and started recording the event. At which point she started to shout at him. And we know all of this is recorded and the veracity of it has never been questioned. Saying, I'm going to call the police and I'm going to tell the police that there is an African-American man who is endangering my life. And everything that we've learned about Amy Cooper since this event tells us she knew all of the right things to say. She did all of the right things. For example, she donated to the Obama campaign. She uses the right language that he is African-American. She, in the spectrum of American culture, she counts as a liberal. But here is the moment of negation where she can say all of the right things and then threaten to call the cops. That is an example of negation. And Freud says of this on page, well, you have a different page number, that negation is a way of taking cognizance of what is repressed. Indeed, it is already a lifting of the repression, though not, of course, an acceptance of what is repressed. I want to use that structure to say that many of us are living in negation. We know the right things to say, we know the right things to believe, and we want to believe the right things. And we believe genuinely that we believe these things. That is also important. But in fact, there is still at work a level of repression. And Freud gives an explanation, and this is where the article begins to become more dense. But I'm going to try and keep it simple because he continues. He makes this very important distinction. He says, what's going on here? And it's an ordinary activity. This is not necessarily some breakdown, but it's related to that. He says, we can see how in this, the intellectual function is separated from the affective process. So negation is an intellectual process, is an intellectual function, but there isn't, which is separate, which lifts the lid, as it were, on the affective or emotional side and a separation begins. And here is the significance of that separation. Negation, there is nothing pathological about this. Because I can deny something which otherwise is obviously true, everyone else can see that it's true, doesn't mean necessarily that I'm in a pathological condition. Indeed, an important aspect in psychoanalytic thinking is that we all have within us not only neurotic elements, but psychotic elements. But this doesn't mean that those psychotic elements are pathological. As it were, some th the psychosis, the psychotic elements only become important when they become pathological, i.e. when they are no longer controllable. And I think that this is what we witnessed um, in the Amy Cooper uh, situation. What happens, says Freud, is that there is a, in this split between the intellectual and the emotional, 
Neurosis, says Freud, is about the interior life. It's about the repression of something in the interior life, a repression of something that I cannot act on. That in some way I already know that I ought not to think, to believe, to desire something, and so it is repressed. But that is in the interior life, the internal life, it says the English translation. On the other hand, the other part of negation, which now takes us into disavowal, is about external reality. The repression on the internal side is distinct from the denial of something in the external world. And Freud recognizes very early that this denial of reality is the beginning of the psychotic dimension of human experience. Because potentially, actually what, the, what psychosis is, is this not only denial of reality, we all do that to some extent, therefore it is normal. It's not pathological. But it is when it becomes pathological when we become detached from that reality. And Freud explains this in the concept of disavowal, which is slight, somewhat different from negation, but it's there in the essay on negation. It's there that he begins to theorize it. Disavowal is a psychological mechanism that allows us to entertain two contradictory beliefs. And this is crucial in Freud's phrasing, side by side. Two contradictory beliefs side by side. The implication being that these two contradictory beliefs can take on a life of their own. When Freud develops this initially, it's in relation to the recognition on the part of the child, the, the male child, that women, girls, don't have a penis not at all interested in that part of it. It's the recognition of the structure that something in reality, something perceptual in reality is being denied at the same time that it is being recognized. That is the devowal, that is the disavowal. It is crucial, not only that it's a kind of negation, but it's a recognition at the same time that it is being denied. And there begins the psychotic mechanism. One of the ways I think that this helps us to theorize certain resistances within the racial context of the United States and the peculiar role that race plays in the United States I agree with Orlando Patterson, and here we're talking about the symbolic dimension. I agree with Orlando Patterson that, of course, every society has its injustices, its codification of injustices, but there is no other society in which race plays the exact role that it does in the United States, and therefore, it is something that has to be looked at in symbolic terms. And what the concept of disavowal enables us to do, and here I want to make just some quick allusions to the work of Stanley Cavell and, acknowledge, and acknowledgement. Because Stanley Cavell has a remarkable chapter in his book, The Claim of Reason, uh, that is devoted to the master-slave relationship. I think it's one of the lesser discussed aspects of Stanley Cavell's work. And it's my conviction that Cavell has actually taken the Freudian model of disavowal as a model for acknowledgement. And he looks at the example of the slave owner who it is said denies the humanity of the slave, denies that the slave is a person, is a human being. And Cavell's argument can be put very simply. There are no circumstances whatsoever 
in which a slave owner could not be aware that his slaves were persons, were people. It is not possible. All of those laws about the vote of a slave being worth three-fifths that of a white person, all of those things are the extraordinary efforts to which we go to maintain a certain structure of the subject. I want to quote from Cavell. He says flatly, no, the slave owner cannot have been unaware that he was dealing with human beings. Quote, he is rather, he says, what is it that the slave owner is missing? about these people who are his property. He is rather missing something about himself, or rather something about his connections with those people, his, in, his internal relations with them. When he wants to be served at table by a black hand, he would not be satisfi satisfied to be served by a black paw. When he rapes a slave or takes her as a concubine, he does not feel that he has, by that fact itself, embraced sodomy, etc. He does not go to great lengths either to convert his horses to Christianity or to prevent their getting wind of it. Everything in his relation to his slaves shows that he treats them as more or less human. His humiliations of them, his disappointments, his jealousies, his fears, his punishments, his attachments. He said, these are the ways in which human beings mistreat human beings. And Cavell then asked, so what is this about not human beings? He answers, it can only be that he means that they are not purely human. He means that there, are, that there are kinds of humans, unquote. And this is where I say that race is a stand-in for the discourse about what it is to be human. Let me conclude here by coming back to Orlando Patterson. Orlando Patterson's claim to fame is an extraordinary book that he wrote called Slavery and Social Death, which is pretty much the basis of that contemporary critical theory that calls itself Afro-pessimism. A less appreciated aspect of Orlando Patterson's oeuvre is his work on freedom. And indeed, Part of Patterson's argument is that we cannot understand slavery anywhere in the world. Because by the way, one of the things that Patterson emphasizes is that slavery is a universal phenomenon. There is no culture which at some point did not practice some form of slavery. And what he means by the slave is someone who is natally alienated, who is dishonored, and who is dominated in their alienation and dishonor. In other words, the total imbalance of power. But he also says that it's through slavery that we, and particularly in America, we get to a certain understanding of freedom. And there are two things that I want to mention um, before I stop and open up from Orlando Patterson. Orlando Patterson says that we cannot think about freedom without thinking about slavery. And second, and we cannot understand the continuing problems between black and white America from the point of view of the organization of power structure of white America without thinking about intimacy. If I take the second one first, 
Patterson says, yes, there have been many achievements from the civil rights movement. There has been what he calls integration into the public domain, however imperfect. Um, there is no America, he would agree with Ralph Ellison, there is no American culture without black culture. But he says what has not happened is that there has been no integration in the private sphere. No integration in the private sphere and no language of intimacy in the private sphere. If we now come back to what Patterson has to say about freedom, Patterson effectively says that within the context of American history and American culture, freedom is defined in terms of not being a black person. And all of the institutions, including this ridiculous thing we call the Electoral College, nothing of its kind exists anywhere in the democratic world. All of our institutions are set up to express this ideal of liberty. And this ideal of liberty is fundamentally defined in terms of not being a slave, which necessarily means not being black. And so the exclusion, the Freudian language here would be expulsion, the expulsion of the black person from the very possibility of liberty, the very possibility of what it means to be free, that is the continuance with which we are dealing. If we want to rethink completely what it might mean, is it integration? There are many people who say, no, we're done with that. If we want to rethink this language, then we have to go back to a certain fundament. What is it? that we have meant historically by liberty, because any adequate analysis would show that our notions of liberty have been predicated on not being black, and thereby the continued expulsion of blackness from spaces of freedom, but even more importantly, from spaces of intimacy. Let me come back to Freud's negation to conclude. When Freud talks about negation in the psychological aspect, he says that negation, logical, grammatical negation, is part of a process that begins not as something logical, not as something grammatical, it begins as a process of incorporation. Incorporation is the psychoanalytic term for wanting to take things into one's body, to interject. He says the examples that you will have looked at in the reading, here are the primitive examples. I should like to eat this incorporate. I should like to spit it out, expulse. I should like to take this into myself and keep that out. It shall be inside me. It shall be outside me. Freud says by the end of the essay on negation that this is the foundation of negation of logical and grammatical negation. This process of incorporation and expulsion is the primitive psychological mechanism also for the formation of identities. But what I find compelling in this context about the examples that Freud chooses is that they are viscerally physical. They're viscerally of the body. 
cannot be more intimate. I should like to eat this. We used to watch movies, didn't we, not so long ago, in which one lover would say to another, you're looking yummy tonight. I could eat you up, or I could eat you alive, because it's no fun to eat somebody dead. We're into Dexter country in that case, but I could eat you up. That language, which is a language of cannibalism, as psychoanalysis understands it, is as fundamental as it gets about intimacy. What do I want to be part of me? And what do I not want to be part of me? And that is not something that we decide for ourselves. And this is where the concept of implantation comes in. By the time these mechanisms are activated, we are already being implanted with certain structures, certain values, and certain beliefs. And here is where I will conclude. And it is that structure of implantation. In another context, we could talk about the role of advertising in shaping implantation. It is that structure of implantation that then determines what we can pay attention to and what we will pay attention to and thereby whether we can care or not. So to care is at one level already shaped for us unless something radical and unexpected happens that leaves us radically exposed and radically vulnerable. And as Judith Butler says in another context, and leaves us open to the possibility of an ethics based upon vulnerability rather than invulnerability. Our ethics, our politics in the United States have been based upon the idea of invulnerability. Everyone feels that they have the right to be invulnerable. And that's what this whole Second Amendment stuff is all about. But I want to conclude with this idea of implantation that to a certain significant degree, it is already shaped for us what it is that we can or may pay attention to and thereby what it is that we may care for. Let me stop there and, and see what questions emerge. Thank you. Thank you so much for this wonderful talk. Um, perhaps while uh, we're waiting for the audience to enter some questions, um, I could get started with questions that came up among students that uh, got together um, to go through some of the readings. Um, and I about, would refer to some of those other readings as appropriate, yes. Um, so for the, perhaps about the implantation, um, and I guess in understanding what care is, individual does not have the agency to maintain that care to continue paying attention. It's something that we are receptive to. And then so thinking about who are the agents that can provide the implantation, that the material that gets us to pay attention. Um, are you, you brought up natural disasters and things that are, you know, or something that's uh, structural, institutional, but are there ways in which an individual can produce this material that gets people to pay attention? You say, who, um, who, are the, um, who are the agents? My response would be, Mayor, what are the agents, not who? We have no choice. We can only do what we think it's right to do. We can be shaped by our, you know, if I'm at Rice, um, there are certain kinds of values, no doubt, that would be um, more prevalent than if I were somewhere else. But it's rather what. So what 
my work is saying is that these questions about acknowledgement, understanding, and solidarity, they're already pre-shaped for us by the way in which structures are implanted. Therefore, it's a different framework that what we are witnessing right now, I would say in America is not um, about, do we like Mr. Trump or not? I think that's wholly irrelevant. Something else is happening where certain values, certain structures may be coming to an end. And it's in the transformation of those structures that the possibility of new modes of implantation may take place. So working for that, this is what, when people talk about structural change, um, that's the rather um, bloodless way in which someone like Elizabeth Warren um, can say, hey, if we, if we want to change the society, it's not just this or that policy, we need to change the whole framework, right? And, it's, and it's, that framework would lead to different forms of agency. Moving on to a question from one of the audience. Yes. Um, uh, an attendee asked, do you see the spatial syntax of the conventional home as a bedrock of familiarity? And therefore, as as a, do I home? see the spatial syntax as a what? Of the conventional home as a bedrock of familiarity and therefore antithetical to care. Let me share my screen with you to respond to that to respond to that question. This is a cotton gin engine that was used in a performance, uh, a, an installation by the now New York based artist, Kevin Beasley, who is a graduate of my college um, CCS. It's a sound piece, it's a cotton gin. And it's been put in a hermetically sealed box. You will notice when you look closely that there are lots of microphones inside. When the audience is in the room, the audience cannot hear anything. If the audience goes to another room, the sound that is being made by the cotton gin that cannot be made, cannot be heard in the same room is, can be heard in this completely separate room. So you cannot see and hear at the same time. You cannot hear and see at the same time. And I've been using this work in a number of different contexts because of course, this is the cotton gin that Kevin used in this work is from Alabama where in 1955, Emmett Till was brutalized and murdered. So one of the things that's going on is that the cotton gin stands in place of, stands for, it's a kind of metonymy for Emmett Till. It's not only Emmett Till by any means, but it is about that. And when we look at that, we can now see the framing of the work and the way in which the work tries to separate modes of attention, modalities of the body. So we cannot see and hear, we cannot hear and see at the same time. It is clearly pointing to the actualization of different possibilities of the body different possibilities of the senses. I'm also struck from the moment my wife and I, my wife artist, but who was initially trained as an architect, when we saw this work at the Whitney in 2018, 2019, it was at the end of 2018, 2019. We both, we saw it independently of each other. We both came to the same view that, wow, this kind of reminds us of Philip Johnson's glass house. Reminds us also of the Barcelona pavilion. Let us say, what is the role of glass here? Now, in the, in the context of Philip Johnson's um, 
glass house. And as I said, behind that, Farnsworth House, behind that, the Barcelona Pavilion. This is, of course, is to do with privilege and it's to do with leisure. And I'm working on an argument to respond more directly to the question that says that the iconography of the glass here, something that we also find in Andre Breton's Nadja, where Breton speaks of wanting to live in a glass house because he has nothing to hide, wanting to live in a glass house where everyone can see him at all times of the day. And I'd like to suggest that there is a way of trying to, that there's a certain kind of practice that is trying to reconfigure domesticity. Because of course, in relation to Emmett Till in the Black experience, the attack on the Black family is also an attack upon domestic, is attack upon domesticity. And so the separation here is a figuration. It's a configuration trying to suggest new modes about how we might relate to exterior and interior. Now, another example that I could mention, a more standard example would be the work of someone like Martha Rosler. And Martha Rosler's work, definitely the um, semiotics of the kitchen, you could watch that video. It's a, what I think eight minute long or so uh, on YouTube. Uh, her collage work, bringing the war, bringing the war home, is all about exploding the confines of domestic, of domestic, of domestic. But I'm suggesting that there is something going on in this, in a kind of quasi-architectural practice that is also a sound practice, an installation practice that is trying to reconfigure interior and exterior and implicitly what it means for blackness now to be part of this type of experience. So I do think that something of the kind is happening and this a lot of this is a bearing on domesticity. And if we speak of domesticity, then we must speak of the traditional home and how the pressure uh, of new forms of domestic relations, new forms of domesticity will lead to a reconfiguring. Um, where I would like to go when I finally get the formulation that I can live with is that there's a way in which the image of the glass house is an invitation to a reconfiguration of domesticity. And I find it um, interesting, in fact, compelling that a young African-American artist is working with an acknowledgement of suffering, but finding a way of framing the affect, framing the suffering so that it's not just a repetition, right? And that means now a reconfiguration of space as well as, as, as a reconfiguration of space as well as of the senses. Uh, the next question that we have, it's from Marcelo Lopez de Mardi. Uh, I have a direct question in the context of the ideas of care, solidarity, and entanglement. Is there a possible reflection of labor, and if at all possible, labor in the politics of visibility in an attention economy? Yes. Uh, in fact, the final chapter of, of my book um, is on the League of Revolutionary Black Workers in Detroit. Um, there in, I've put this work in dialogue with the film, the essay film um, by John O'Comfra called Nine Muses, which is both the, so John, John O'Comfra in 2010 created this amazing film, essay film uh, called Nine Muses, which is, uses Homer's Odyssey as a framework for meditating on migration, black migration from the West Indies, but also Indian migration from the Indian subcontinent into England, and it's basically concentrated on Birmingham. And Birmingham is a cultural and industrial equivalent of Detroit, i.e. it's the car capital of the, of the United Kingdom. So this, you have this thinking about migratory bodies. The League of Revolutionary Black Workers made a film in 1970 called Finally Got the News, 
again, you can watch it on YouTube. It's only about 45 minutes long. And it's a documentary about themselves, about the League of Revolutionary Black Workers. And it begins with a montage, about a four minute montage, that is entirely about migration. The migration first of black bodies from Africa to the United States, and then a longer section on migration of black bodies from the south of the United States into the industrial centers of the United States, Detroit, uh, most obviously. And one, one of the key images in the montage is Diego Rivera's Detroit Industry Mural. And there's a particular part of this very large um, mural that they choose, and it's the, the glass foundry. It's the hottest and most dangerous and most exposed part of the car industry. And one of the things that they do with this, and of course, as the hottest and most dangerous and most exposed part, it's where, surprise, the workers are normally black, right? Uh, they have the dirtiest, they have the, the most dangerous work. So one of the things that I'm doing in that is to make an argument that the leak, because the labor is very important in social practice, and I'm trying to rethink what labor means. But in the context of the League of Revolutionary Black Workers, I'm arguing that the, the workplace is a kind of modern version of Plato's allegory of the cave. And that as long as that you're within the cave, there is no visibility. And as long as there is no visibility, then there is no possibility of care. In fact, it, in this chapter, I try to move from what is an ethics of care to what might be a politics of care. Joan Tronto, in her very important book called Moral Boundaries, an argument for a politics of care, uh, is one of the people that I'm in uh, that I'm in dialogue with here. But the fundamental argument is that. This radical branch of labor not only rejected management, they rejected the union because they saw their situation as a profound lack of care. And the only solution to this profound lack of care was to practice a kind of politics of visibility. And so in my framing, they have to, they have to get out of the factory because the factory is the cave, the factory is the ignorance, the factory is everything that stops the possibility of connection to a larger audience of care. And so I would say my argument absolutely there is that um, using the League of Revolutionary Black Workers as my example is that ultimately it could be said that all forms of activism are an appeal for care and are part of a practice of care. Thank you. Um, perhaps this is a, a follow-up to... Uh, surely, surely. There's another question. Um, so Amelie Eng is asking, um, thank you so much for your incredible and insightful talk. Can you talk a bit more about how a collapse of familiarity can open up moments of care and solidarity? Are these moments short-term? as estrangement seems to be momentary, and how might we extend to longer terms or sustained forms of care? Oh, that's a superb, all the questions have been good, but that is a particularly pointed question. One of the things that I asked um, the group to listen to was an episode of the NPR podcast Code, Code Switch, which is a black oriented podcast, black, contemporary politics, is social issues. And there's a really, really powerful episode where they talk to a psychologist who basically says, oh, by the way, in psychology, we already know that in the kinds of conditions of COVID, they're going to be there's going to be unrest. And that episode I found to be incredibly poignant poignant because you could see that the interviewers were desperately wanting to feel that something was changing in America. <laughs> Not 
something that was predictable if you were a social psychologist. Something was changing. That question, why now, why now? I would say the next question is, and will it last? <laughs> How long will it last? Because yes, there is going to be a snapback. Now, let me take the first part of the question. Radical exposure and radical vulnerability in the collapse of familiarity is the moment or the occasion where we can think what it means to be human without all of the preconceptions that have become part of our everyday. Going back to your question right at the beginning about implantation, in a way, the avant-garde has, has had a lot to say about the everyday and a lot that is creative about the everyday. But there's another sense in which the everyday is, is the way in which our society acts through us. It's the way in which by participating in the repetition of rituals, by participating in the repetition of certain structures and behaviors, we reproduce society. That society is acting through us. This is not necessarily a bad or evil thing uh, by any means, but the ever, there's a part of the everyday which, which is what Heidegger is trying to go beyond, where the everyday is simply a means by which social structures are reproduced through our participation and our behaviors. And then there are these moments, which by definition must be unexpected, unanticipated, where all bets are off. And there is no guarantee that we will think in terms of solidarity, but one finds on balance, there is thinking in terms of solidarity. But we also notice, don't we, that in the beginning of disasters, there is a sense of solidarity. Why do strangers go to, Cat go, they don't go to Katrina, they go to New Orleans. Why do strangers go all over the country, all over the world out of a sense of solidarity and then it wears off? So we can anticipate that this moment cannot last forever, but the moment offers certain possibilities. And that's one of the reasons I think that we can't talk and shouldn't talk in through, through a language of prediction. There are possibilities. Who can seize, what groups, what mechanisms are there to allow us to seize those possibilities? Um, that strikes me as the question, but that we, that these, mo these moments of exposure, radical exposure and radical vulnerability give us a sense of how we might rethink sociality, right? That's basically what is it, what is it issue. Um, part of my larger project in the book is to say what we call social practice only makes sense because of a keen awareness of broken sociality. There's an article that I, a short article I, I published a couple of years ago called Care Comes in the Wake of Retreat. As it were, we only begin to care in the sense that I've been talking about, we only begin to care when we're confronted with collapse. We only begin to care when we're confronted with loss, with, with withdrawal where we only begin to care, that is to say, we only begin to realize the possibilities of a new way of thinking about what it is to be human, to begin the construction, as Sylvia Winter would say, of a new narrative of what it means to be human. When we are confronted with retreat, withdrawal, with collapse, with voiding. 
but that can't last. And in fact, it shouldn't last because that condition, if it were to obtain indefinitely, would also in its own way lead to massive inequalities because it would lead to the exploitation of, um, of the weak by the strong, which is what you see in many situations. The moment you have some natural disaster, all kinds of nasty things are released. Um, natural disasters are, COVID is a slow motion disaster, by the way, right? You know, earthquake is quick and then we, have, we start rebuilding. The temporality of COVID is part of what is challenging for us. But in this um, scenario, we don't want this to be indefinite because that in its own way can lead to massive exploitation. So I'm concentrating on the moment where we suddenly see the possibility of rethinking sociality, a broken sociality, and we're looking for models of new kinds of language for rethinking sociality in these cases. Thank you so much. Uh, unfortunately, I believe that we're out of time. We have quite a few more oh, questions, um, but it's 7.40. Um, so I just want to say that on behalf of Bryce Architecture, um, I like to call for a virtual round of applause and thank you for sharing um, your work with us this evening, um, Michael. Uh, yeah. The kind of the politics of care, this idea of an intimate solidarity, I think it's it's kind of a really incredible and timely um, kind of thing to have a conversation with about. So um, thank you so much. Well, let me also, Brittany, thank you very much for the invitation. And uh, once more, Christine, thank you. And guys, thank you for listening. I'm, I'm deeply appreciative of this opportunity. And I hope if things get better, that I can pay a visit to Houston. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Okay, guys, thank you so much. Thank you all. all right. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Um, good, good evening. And to our audience, um, please join us next week at noon on Monday, October 26th for the second part of About Paying Attention with Ilsa Wolf and Heinrich Wolf.